Welcome to episode 29 of Rail Talk. I know you weren't expecting to see us again this week, but we have a very special reason why we're jumping back on these mics to record the second Rail Talk of the week, which, as always, is sponsored by Facing Tipton, the Green Group, and TaylorMade. Shout out to the sponsors, as always. I'm Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. And, John, this is our Woodward and Bernstein moment. This really is Joe, a Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. I, I'm like, I didn't sleep well last night because I was so excited about uh, this interview and and rapping, uh, you know, with you and and Tinky. You know, this is going to be breaking down some doors and and opening up some conversation um, to the likes that that you and I really wish that we have. We want to be open and honest and and give everyone a forum to to discuss, you know, what they see and their opinions. And and there's nobody more opinionated, I think, than than Tinky. Um, but what's beautiful about Tink is that he or she, we don't know yet, um, has actual rational thinking behind what they post. Unlike a lot of us, other knuckleheads, me included, that post things on on uh, the devil's playground known as X. <laughs> All right, so this is a bonus episode of Rail Talk. Like, we're not getting paid overtime or any of this stuff, but when the opportunity to get a horse racing Twitter celebrity comes upon us, we got to hop back on these mics and put in the hours. So, John, today, theoretically, we're going to be talking to a man named Tinky. We don't know much else about him. We know that he gets under Mike Rapoli's skin. That's for sure. He's a he's a very eloquent guy on Twitter. Guy or girl? We actually don't know yet. We don't know if he's a guy or girl until we actually see them. Um, but he has agreed to come on the show and talk about a myriad of racing issues. And you know, he hasn't done any interviews as far as I know right. thus far. Um, I guess we're just that special, John. Well, that that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, let, less you know you and me. Um, but it is it is a big deal. I mean, this is like up there with uh, LeBron James's decision of where he was taking his talents, um, and Vader being Luke's father. Uh, you know, this oh, is like spoiler. This is oh, sorry, spoiler. spoiler. <laughs> this is this is like a big. It's not going to be kind of a reveal, but this is going to be a really big deal. Solomon Rushdie being interviewed. I mean, like you know, Tinky has come out of hiding basically um, and picked plucked us out of all the different media outlets that that uh that that are in our our niche market here in thoroughbred racing joe he picked us he picked us i feel like maybe we're even on the bachelor like he gave us the rose that we're going to be doing but all i can tell you is that it's going to be a rip roaring great conversation um and and i brought my popcorn so i am ready to be entertained so we've been counting down to this for a little bit right now. We need a drum roll sound effect, I think, for this next guest. Uh, he is, to me, one of the most interesting people in the horse racing sphere right now. And he also has a distinction of being the only person whose Twitter account got better when they paid for more characters. He's taken the racing Twitter world by storm. Tinky, welcome to Rail Talk. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my my first public appearance, so to speak. And uh uh, under the nom de plume and yeah. uh you know i've enjoyed uh, the work that you two have been putting out for some time and uh, uh it should be fun yeah i mean it's, we're, we're honored to have you um let's just jump into it like this because this is the first anonymous guest that we've had on the show obviously we don't have your your video your picture unless you are in fact wc fields and <laughs> we might distort the audio a little bit so without giving away too much of you know who you are and your background can you just tell us give us some some clues and some tea leaves and you know how you got into racing some of your formative memories like what brought you to the world of horse racing well I grew up in the Chicago area, the greater Chicagoland area, and uh, the genesis, the, the singular genesis of my interest in horse racing and ultimately uh, much more was that I had a close friend, really my best friend during those days, and I still am very friendly with him, although we live in different places, pretty far apart. Uh, he and I... Um, we're big sports fans. We um, had a particular interest in basketball and like to go to basketball games, et cetera. And his mother uh, brought us to Arlington Park, the old Arlington Park. And this would have been in the early 1970s. I mean, I, you know, I like to say that I'm not a spring chicken and I guess that, that makes it fairly clear. Uh, and I would say that both of us, uh, were really captivated 
quickly. I mean, there was there, there were a number of things that resonated. I, I don't have a specific memory of that day, but I know that it was a catalyst for the two of us choosing to uh, uh, to go out to the races on our own. We weren't yet old enough to legally bet, and yes. I guess the the excitement of being able to do that was something uh, that played a, a role. Um, but really, I think what what brought us to develop a passion so quickly for the game was the rapid realization that there was a huge amount of information. Um, and that it needed to be processed in certain ways in order to gain some kind of advantage. I mean, we, we understood that. Uh, you know, we, we hadn't read racing forms previously, but the first time and the second and the third and the 20th and the 100th time that we o- cracked open racing forms in those days, paper racing forms, you know, it was, it was fascinating and thrilling to have all of these puzzles uh, that we could attempt to solve and that there were such potentially uh, exciting, tangible results, betting the money that we had in our pockets in those days and maybe walking out of the track with significantly more. So I, I really did cut my teeth early on at the Chicago racetracks and uh, betting on horses was the the primary initial driver uh, I wasn't, uh, I didn't bet on football, baseball, basketball. It was, you know, horse racing, it was clear, was much more interesting uh, to me and to, to my friend. Uh, and uh, and so we really dove into it and began our our initial education in the game that way. And, and, and you fall back on the 50 years, 50 plus years of uh, of of racing interest, um, it seems like in a lot of your tweets, and it, you know, one of the things that attracted me to to your you know t- to your stream was the fact that you produce rational thoughts backed up by facts, um, which is something that that we appreciate and we try to talk about all the time here on 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 Rail Talk. One of the things that that you've been very outspoken about, one of the topics is Mike Rapoli, the self-proclaimed commissioner, um, whose original idea was to build a community of leaders to get together around the table and try to, um, as as he put it, try to get the Titanic away from the iceberg. Um, yet it seems like that that's not the direction that he's going in right now. And and he's he's thrown some barbs your way. Um, what do you feel about Mike's idea? And 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 do we need to have a commissioner or a czar in racing? Well, I. Uh... <laughs> responded initially to his announcement of the formation of, of the NTA National Thoroughbred Alliance, which is his baby. And um, the essence of how I reacted was that uh, almost everyone, I would think, who is in the game shares at least some of Mike's goals, um, maybe most of them, maybe all of them. Uh, but the problem, I'd say there are two main problems that I've had with how Mike has uh, has rolled out his effort over the last few months. The first is the question of how his stated goals might realistically be accomplished. You know, it, it, I'm not going to suggest that it's easy to even uh, uh, talk in a in a simple way about how to solve the myriad problems that the the racing game is is grappling with at this stage. Um, but it's certainly a lot easier to talk about them than it is to to have some plan of action that. Uh, that seems realistic, and and I'm I'm skeptical of of at least some of of what Mike's stated goals are, uh, not least of which would be well um, when we were talking about the mayor cap, and perhaps we'll get more deeply into that topic later in the discussion. Uh, but he he seems to be on the one hand on board with the idea of a mayor cap, but I asked him, I challenged him to explain how someone like John Magner uh, might also be on board with it. Uh, Because as wealthy as Mike may be, you know, we're talking about orders of magnitudes difference in terms of power in the industry. And uh, 
I just, you know, think that it's not, I don't mean to single out Magner, he's certainly not alone, but uh, the people who, who have real power in the, in the breeding industry are, I think, rather unlikely to choose to adopt uh, changes, let alone radical changes, that are going to adversely impact their bottom lines. And so even if Mike himself uh, is willing to make some significant personal sacrifices, which would be admirable, I think that that there are some very real questions about whether or not others uh, who are much more powerful than him would follow suit. The second issue that I have with him, which is what uh, was primarily the source of the sparring that he and I have been doing on Twitter, is the obvious and really quite remarkable dissonance between what he talked about when he stated his original goals with the NTRA and uh, how he's gone about uh, attempting to make progress in those areas. I mean, you know, he, he talked about the need for uh, an alliance, for reaching out to the various uh, industry stakeholders, I mean, I'll quote specifically from one of his from one of his uh, you know initial tweets. I want this to be an, be an alliance, not a club or association, because clubs and associations are exclusive, or you have to pay to join them or be voted in. The alliance is inclusive, and it's what's missing in the game. There is no one looking at the game holistically as one brand. No one has a vision for what's going on. This will be a shared vision. It's about unity. It's about getting people to work together. Well, okay, that all sounds terrific, but. Then he has been uh, consistently insulting uh, the chairman of the jockey club, Stuart Janney, and has been, has been disparaging about the jockey club more broadly speaking. And I have challenged him repeatedly about that, and he doesn't back down. And it really leads me to wonder uh, whether or not he's... Uh, in a position to seriously lead uh, an organization that that has the goals of uh, of major reform in the industry. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is my initial take from Rapoli announcing this National Thoroughbred Alliance was that it seemed a little bit redundant considering the advent of HISA and the federal regulation and oversight and kind of umbrella organization coming in that we've been wanting and and crying out for, I think, for a long time in racing to have that unification. You know, do you how do you feel about that? Like, do you think there is space for a Rapoli led organization and Heisa? Do you think that they should just work together? And just what's what's your feeling? And it's a very multi part question, but like, what's your feeling about the first year, year and a half of Heisa? Like, is it doing its job or does it need help from guys like Rapoli? Well, that's a big question, <laughs> and, <Yes. laughs> and uh, I'll I'll try to I'll try to uh, keep my my response uh, limited to some extent. You know, ideally, I think we could all agree. Ideally, the racing industry would have an authoritative centralized body like those that are found in other sports, the major sports. Now, there are a lot of reasons why that's probably not a realistic option, but um, that would be ideal. HISA, I don't think was ever designed to be that or even close to that. I think that HISA was designed to help the industry to become uh, more cohesive and consistent with regard to certain aspects of the industry, you know, including obviously horse safety, uh, the PED issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the, uh, you know, the HISA, we can talk about HISA in depth. Um, but I, on the one hand, I do think that there is room for another authoritative body uh, alongside HISA that could help with uh, aspects of the industry that HISA isn't really designed to address uh, or have any power over. But whether Mike Rapoli and his nascent NTA are likely to you know, develop into that role, I think is, uh, is highly questionable at this point. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And, and and Tink, with with regard to 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 Mike, um, it, you know, one of the things that that I scratch my head about is obviously he's had great success um, recently in in racing and with you know standing some horses at, at at stud, and and he's been a nice you know breath of fresh air for the industry. He's been a new shooter that's come in and spent literally tens of millions of dollars on on yearlings and everything. Um, but yet he gets kind of caught up in this. I feel like he gets kind of caught up in this, but I'm, I'm a big shot and I should be able to do things because I'm Mike Rapoli. Um, and, and I think that, that, that turns a lot of people off so much so that like, you know, try to revisit history at the November phasic sale. Um, you know, he, he bought nest. Okay. Now people are, are, are saying that's wonderful. He bought nest. So the horse, the mayor wouldn't go to Japan because Japan's stealing all of that, stealing, buying all of our good brood mares and, and they're going to beat us. But in reality, Mike didn't buy nest. Mike bought out his partner at 50 cent dollars. So it wasn't, I don't think, I mean, I can't get into his head, but it wasn't that he was doing this for the betterment of the industry and he didn't want the Japanese to get the horse. I think it just made sense because it was 50 cent dollars that he was spending compared to other parties that were hundred cent dollars. Yet he doesn't, he doesn't go out of his way to, correct that when people uh, praise him for, for some of these uh, attributes and some of these actions, is, is it just that, that a guy like that just doesn't have the personality to be able to work together or, or is it that he's afraid that, that people are going to say, you've been a success now, you haven't been in the business for 30, 40, 50 years. So you don't really have a full understanding of the history of what's going on and why certain decisions are being made. What, 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 what's your take on that? I think that uh, that Mike uh, is certainly well intentioned. Mm-hmm. He's passionate about the game. You know, there are a lot of things to like about him, and uh, he's obviously been extremely successful in the, in the private sector. But as anyone who has been in the game for a long time knows, there is a very long list of extremely wealthy owners who have made the false assumption that their successes in the private sector are likely to translate to great <laughs> success in the business. And yep. even though Mike has had some success, I mean, a lot of success, Tremendous success. In, 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 in the business, you know, we have no idea really what his bottom line is. And the other point that I would make in that uh, area is that, you know, Mike has ridden a wave uh, he got in at a point where bloodstock values were, you know, shooting up rapidly. I think it was uh, it was concurrent with and connected to uh, the biggest uh, credit slash debt bubble uh, in the broader economy that the world has ever seen. Uh, so, I mean, you could even say he was smart to get involved when he did, and he's you know he's done you know relatively well or well as a result of that, but. Now he's in a he's in a different uh, aspect of the game, and he I think uh, is assuming that his style as a self described disruptor uh, can work as it did apparently to some extent uh, when when he was building or is still building businesses in the private sector. I mean, you know the the status quo. Uh, in the racing industry, while we can all agree that there's a lot wrong with it and that it needs to be shaken up, you know, the status quo is populated by a very large number of extremely wealthy and powerful people. And, you know, Mike Rapoli uh, is not going to shake that up on his own or with a few people following him. You know, uh, at the end of the, the Nick Luck interview with Stuart Janney, uh, as I posted recently, Janney said, and I'm quoting uh, with respect to Mike, I don't know that he's come forward with anything like an actual plan, which, you know, is important in the final analysis. <laughs> and you got to work with people. That's critical in every part of our lives. And he's going to have to learn how to do that. Otherwise, he's not going to be terribly important to the discussion. And I think that while Mr. Janney uh, can be criticized for certain things, I think that that understated uh, response to the rather reckless, in my view, uh, repeated insults that that Mike had been lobbing over the weeks and months 
at Mr. Janney, I think that really gets to the heart of the matter. I mean, you would think that anyone who was really serious and uh, mature uh, would understand what Janney said and would be following that advice, but it's not happening. I mean, this is one of the things that one of my complaints about about Mike is that I think his heart is in the right place in a lot of instances here, but you got to do more than talk to talk. You got to actually be able to sit down with people and listen to people. And I wish that he would come on, our, preferably our show, but any show really, and have a conversation with you because you've had a lot of smart and measured criticisms of what he's put forth or in most cases hasn't put forth. So I think that that's got to be a big part of it as well. But you mentioned that there are things to be critical about of Stuart Janney and of the leadership that racing currently has. Like, What are some of the things that have kind of gotten your goat over the years that you wish racing might be more proactive upon on, or, you know, might be more willing to fix and unify to, to rectify, because for me, it's, you know, drug policy has taken way too long to unify. There has not been a concerted effort to bring new betters into the game and lower takeout in the same fell swoop. I, I just think that there's been, there's been a lot of people asleep at the switch for a long time, which does, I think, lend credence to the idea that Mike Rapoli has that it, we need a new voice. You know, what are some of the things that you think racing has done a bad job about that uh, on that you would like to see, you know, improved going forward? I do think that the jockey club has warrants criticism on, you know, on a number of uh, uh, issues um, among other things uh, based most recently on the aforementioned uh, recent interview with Nick Luck that, that Jenny had, uh, you know, there's an apparent, a remarkable over-reliance on the McKinsey consulting firm uh, to try to address long-standing problems in the industry. And, you know, I, no one should expect uh, Stuart Janney to be an expert in, in every aspect of the game and particularly something like wagering. But if the jockey club is relying on McKinsey to try to explain uh, and, and understand why wagering has effectively plummeted roughly 50% in inflation adjusted dollars over the last 20 years. Well, that's a problem, you know, and, and it's, it, it's, it's the type of problem that I think Mike is right about that, you know, the jockey club needs to be more inclusive. They need to bring people in. If they, if they want to be involved in trying to solve this problem, bring the people in who are actual experts in this. And Mike, to his credit, you know, has hired Pat Cummings, who is undoubtedly one of the experts in the industry. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a very positive thing. Uh, the Jockey Club, I also think, um, uh, has dropped the ball with regards to data. Now, you know, this is a, this is a, a bee in the bonnet of a lot of people, and I'm sure you two have talked about it at times. Um, you know, even though I'm not a better when it comes to, uh, to other sports, uh, I'm a, a very longstanding uh, Oakland fan uh, in football. I wanted to say Oakland Raiders. Of course, they're the Las Vegas Raiders now. Uh, and I, growing up in Chicago, I'm a Bulls fan. So, you know, I, I when I'm I'm talking with people online about about the team and debating things and so on, I, I like to look at statistics. I mean, the statistics that are available on sites like Basketball Reference and Football Reference, uh, you know, it's it's incredible the yep. the, the 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 depth and variety of free statistics that are available to all fans in other sports. And, you know, when I see what people have to pay for past performances and so on and so forth in the racing industry, I think that's, it's highly damning. And I think that's one of the areas, given that the jockey club owns Equibase, essentially, that, that they should have, you know, been much more, you know, proactive in. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and there are other things, but those, those are a couple of, of obvious problems with the jockey club. So I'm, I'm not as the, uh, as some of my, uh, critics would like to think a reflexive apologist for the, <laughs> for the jockey club. Uh, yeah. I'm going to stop there for a moment. I mean, I could continue because you talked about the whole game. Yes. There are many, many other things that we can talk about, but I'll let you, you come right. in again now. Yeah. yeah and just, just to, Sorry, John, just to, to piggyback on that point. I don't know if you ever watch college basketball or bet college basketball, but Ken Pomeroy does advanced metrics for college basketball. If you go to KenPom.com, it's got incredible data that you can use to bet college basketball, which I do occasionally. And it's not that I'm watching college basketball nonstop. It's that I feel like I have the data at my fingertips to make informed decisions and racing just hasn't really proliferated that in a way that's conducive to, you know, getting, getting people to come in without feeling like they have to be experts. Go ahead, John. Yeah. I just, to, no, I think it's a great point, Joe. And, and, and think just to, 
follow up on on the jockey club you know we we talk all the time about or they talk all the time about the mckinsey report the mckinsey report it's it, it's the holy grail that that they make all their decisions upon but what they're not saying is that that report that analysis is over a decade old and that so many things have changed in the world as in general and and you know and and with our sport over the past 10 years that it it, it would behoove them i would think to reevaluate and have another report done um, because, you know, so many things have changed since the last time they did it. it. One of the things that needs to be changed in my estimation also is, you know, we talk about how the breed is so incestuous and and we're, we're you know, climbing over each other genetically because we have too many inbreeding. You go through the 140 people who are members of the jockey club and it's the same families. It's the same families that were there 50 years ago and 70 years ago. And, and now it's just the third or fourth generation. So the idea of getting new ideas and new entrepreneurs into the group, unless you're one of the, the blue bloods of Kentucky, it's really tough to do. And, and Joe, I don't know if I mentioned this to you. I looked at the 140 people who were on the list and there's at least a dozen people who haven't invested dollar one in the business in over a decade, yet they're still considered members of the jockey club. So how, how do we how do we fix it? Because it is a private club. So how do we how do we fix it where the jockey club would, you know, we would in, in be encouraged to bring in new people with new ideas and and maybe, uh, you know, try to take a new stab at, at, at the uh, at the new world? Oh, I'm sorry, Joe, do you want to respond to that? No, this goes way all <laughs> goes way over my head. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, no, no. Listen, I have no, uh, I have no easy answers to uh, most of the the ills that afflict the game. I mean, I can I can offer some, you know, uh, suggestions and so on. But as far as the jockey club uh, becoming more open and uh, you know embracing uh, 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 creative and uh, and perhaps disruptive new strategies to try to improve the game that that's one of the problems and it's part of the reason that i am fundamentally cynical i mean i love the game i i developed uh, this incredible passion for it uh, 50 years ago or so. And the passion, you know, uh, led to my being able to, uh, earn a, a living for a long period of time, doing something that rarely felt like work. I mean, it's in, you know, I, I didn't get rich, but, but I feel like I really do owe something to the game because, uh, there, there are few more, there are a few blessings that are, that are, you know, more tangible than being able to work at something that doesn't feel like work. That's a passion. And, you know, that's what artists do and so on. And, um, and so, you know, my, my efforts at this stage of my career and this stage of my life are largely, uh, due to, uh, to the, the disappointment that I feel, and it is deep disappointment of having watched uh, a downward trajectory in many of the fundamental aspects of the game, uh, and the trajectory has uh, become more steep, you know, over the last 20 years than it was over the first 30 years. And I mean, there, there are many different things that we can talk about um, that that relate to that. But, uh, but you know, I, I don't really think that that the jockey club is likely uh, to open up in the way that, that, that we would like. Um, yeah. I think that it is going to take, uh, some kind of a crisis or great pressure. Uh, you know, we've seen changes. I think, you know, HISA was partly catalyzed, uh, catalyzed by the sad, um, clusters of deaths and high profile breakdowns and so on. Um, and you know, those are some of the things that the jockey club does deserve credit for that they, mm -hmm. that they were the catalyst be behind HISA. They were the originators of the, the hiring of five stones, which led to the, the convictions of John service and, uh, adjacent service, excuse me, and, uh, George Navarro et al. And, uh, so the jockey club has certainly done some good, the things that they've done with, uh, the Grayson mm -hmm. foundation also mm -hmm. a lot of good things have come from the jockey club, but we're going to need, uh, we're going to need to uh, uh, to exert some kind of pressure from the outside. I don't know if Mike Rapoli is the one to do it, but either that or a crisis, or it's hard to see it happening. Yeah, I mean, and this is this is my overall point about 
you know, why, why I think your voice is valuable and why I think Mike Rapoli's voice is valuable as well is that we should be able to internally criticize racing and internally criticize the stakeholders in racing without it being seen as a personal attack or that everything is terrible. Like, and I, that's one of my issues with Mike and the way he's responded to you. It's like, it hasn't been with the, the serious intent of engaging and improving. And it's just like a gif here, or like I make more money than you or whatever it is. You gotta be able to sit down with people you don't necessarily agree with guy. I don't agree with a lot. And I think that, you know, he's, he's it, it, the, the, Discussion about Bob Baffert in this industry has very, very little nuance. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on to talk about this in a nuanced way, because that's something you do very well in your your Twitter threads. You know, Baffert, when he gets brought up, he's either like Satan incarnate or he's the greatest trainer of all time. And everybody who criticizes him is just jealous and this and that. As someone who has the historical perspective and has seen tons of great trainers and prolific trainers along the way, uh, just what's your feeling on Bob Baffert? A, the way he trains horses and B, has he been a positive overall positive or net negative you think for the game? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, I think that uh, taking the, the latter part of your question first, um, I don't think it's easy to say. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, just a personal view. I think that he's a net negative because I think that he has uh, been in in a very real sense, a poster boy for some of the biggest problems that have emerged in the industry uh, over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. One of those is what I like to call pushing the envelope. Uh, this is a big topic, and we could probably l literally spend hours talking about it. But there is no doubt that Bob Baffert pushes, has pushed the envelope over decades when it comes to uh, both medication and training horses hard. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not the first one to do it. Uh, Woody Stevens trained horses very hard and is widely considered to have been a, a great, great trainer. Uh, but with regard to the, the medication issue, um, you know, Baffert's, Baffert's record is clear. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't really, when I was thinking about how to, how to uh, talk about these kind of issues uh, on this show, I, I didn't want to weigh it down by reading off facts and figures. I mean, I can do that on the Twitter feeds and people can, you know, when I write posts on these issues, I'll back it up with the facts and you can read the facts. But the facts are out there. I've written about it many times. You know, Baffert has been, I mean, and, and this is as kindly as I can put it, he's been an envelope pusher. Okay. Um, yeah. I can also say, presumably without getting into trouble, that Baffert's career uh, coincides with uh, a real explosion of the use of cutting edge performance enhancing drugs. I'm not asserting that he necessarily was one of those, but he, his career coincided with it. Mm -hmm. And when you think about what that meant for the trainers like Baffert, who were uh, either at the top of the, the heap or aiming for, for the, the, the top dog status on their circuits, um, there was an awful lot of incentive uh, to join in because the risks were very low and the rewards were very high. When I was first uh, cutting my teeth in Chicago, you know, and not just in Chicago, tracks everywhere around the country, the average trainers had somewhere between 15 and 40 horses in their barn. Probably the average trainer had 15 to 20 horses. Some had more, um, but uh, not much more. And even what would have been the rough equivalent of a super trainer back in those days, like Woody Stevens, the horse, the, the excess horses that he had were not stabled in, in three other tracks in various places around the country. They were on farms waiting to come in when a horse broke down. Next one comes in. That's part of the reason he was able to be very hard on his horses in training. If they didn't last, okay, he's got five more promising ones with big pedigrees to come in, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's changed dramatically. And what we have now with the super trainers has been, I think, severely debilitating to the game. First of all, let's look at it through the lens of the betters. Well, you have much 
smaller fields than you used to have. You have a much uh, more compressed menu of races. And I'm not suggesting that these things are due solely to the super trainers, but it's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. If Todd Pletcher or Bob Baffert have three or four or five horses for a particular condition, they're not running them all in that condition. And those races frequently don't go. They'll go when their Baffert or Pletcher are ready or Asmussen are ready to put their horses in, but not necessarily until they're ready to, to put them in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was growing up and I went racing in New York as well uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, you know, there, there were there were a other thans, two uh, not a other than optional claimers, a other thans, two other than allowances, three other than allowances, four other than allowances, and uh, some of them were uh, longer races, not sprint races, right. and sometimes they were mile and an eighth. A uh, mile and a quarter, mile and a half on the grass, and so on. Those kind of races have all but now, sure, we still have eight other thans and two other thans, but everything else has pretty much disappeared. Right. And super trainers have played a real important role in that. So, I mean, that's a real uh, bee in my bonnet. And, you know, Baffert again is a, you know, one of these, not the only one, certainly, but he's a poster child for that. So, for me, uh, to address the question of whether, of whether Baffert is net, net negative or net positive, when you take into account Especially uh, all the cluster of deaths a few years ago, uh, the number of po the huge number of positives that uh, medication positives that he's had, his contentiousness when it comes to litigating uh, the positive uh, findings, um, you know, all of those things I think have been uh, negative for the industry. I'll let you come in again before. I mean, I could go on and on about Baffert, but I'll let you check in again. Yeah, no, and 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 Tink, I'm sure you know that one of the reasons why Joe and Patty and I wanted to start this podcast uh, was because we made direct comments about Baffert and and the team that he has, um, and that and that we we weren't so eloquent as you are to say net negative, but in essence, we criticized them, and because of that, um, you know, we decided that we, we it got censored, and we decided that we were going to start this podcast where we wouldn't have that kind of criticism if we feel like that there's an ill in the game that we want to discuss. Um, and, and and I've been very outspoken. Joe's been very outspoken about our feelings with Baffert. They're they're in line with with what you've said as far as net negative. Um, but I still believe that Churchill Downs is still harboring ill will towards Baffert um, by you know with him embarrassing them in essence by having horses test positive in their biggest races and. They're they're kind of moving in my estimation. They're kind of moving the goalposts on him a little bit. And, and again, I I'm not a Baffert fan, but is it fair what Churchill Downs is doing as far as saying we'll give you a two year ban? And then when he fought it a little bit, they said, "Well, you're a petulant child. We're going to give you another year ban." Yeah, I will say that I agree that it is somewhat personal between uh, Baffert and uh, Mr. Carsingen, if I'm pronouncing his name properly. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that anyone would have reacted poorly if Churchill had allowed him to run his horses in the Derby this year. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I have taken a little bit of a contrarian position uh, on this issue uh, online. And the reason is that Churchill Downs, I think, made it fairly clear that one of the big problems that they had was Baffert's unwillingness to accept accountability. Right. Yep. Yep. This is a clear pattern in his history. And for the first time, perhaps ever, uh, in, in his long string of litigious reactions to uh, medication uh, violation suspensions and so on, uh, Churchill Downs stood up to it. And Baffert, to this day, has not really taken full responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, I'm going to... Uh, delve in a, in a little bit of detail uh, into why I think Churchill had a right to be 
really unhappy about how how Baffert handled himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the defense that Baffert and his expensive attorneys uh, maintained for years (laughs) in their efforts to... uh, uh, to overturn or appeal the, uh, the, sus- the various suspensions and, of course, to, to get um, their, uh, their horse to, to be allowed to stand as the winner of the Medina Spirit, as the winner of the, of the Derby. You know, it was, I think, on close inspection, a really dishonest approach. Mm-hmm. The, the, the idea that because it was Odomax. Uh, that's their claim, by the way. Uh, really hasn't been proven, but uh, that that let's assume that it was the idea that because uh, that's how the substance got into Medina Spirits system somehow uh, was uh, exonerating is you know patently and obviously false. The rules in <laughs> Kentucky were very clear mm-hmm. and it didn't matter how it got into the system. So, you know, he, he not only didn't take responsibility initially, but he allowed his attorneys to string out the series of appeals mm-hmm. over years and to go public with their claims, many of which were dubious, while Churchill basically had to remain mum uh, in terms of their defenses. And right. even though they prevailed, as they should have, in court, it was abusive of Baffert to do that. Right. And I think, finally, that it's noteworthy that he didn't even come out uh, in any way uh, and say something that could be considered anything like an apology until <laughs> after it was clear that he was not going to be able to run in this year's Derby. He right. then came out uh, and essentially said, I want to thank uh, Churchill Downs and the Kentucky uh, Horse Racing Board for listening to our arguments or something along those lines, you know, right. sort of a sort of a backhanded apology. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, that would have been uh, the reason I'm going into the, the reason I've gone into this kind of depth is because I do truly believe that if Baffert at any point had come out and said, look, I screwed up. Mm-hmm. This is on me. Right. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I apologize to Churchill Downs. I apologize to fans of the game. I had, you know, I, sh- I should have uh, seen this coming. No, he didn't nope. do that. And nope. that's why I don't really think that Churchill Downs was entirely wrong to extend it further. Right. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir here. That's what I've said over and over again, that if he just apologized and took responsibility from the jump, none of this would have happened. And it, yeah, both things can be true. Churchill Downs is being petty, and he also brought this upon himself. I think that's a good place to break. We've, we touched, the ma- touched on the major topics. Obviously, there's a lot more to get to. 140 mayor cap, some more wagering topics. Where in the hell the name Tinky comes from? So, Tink, <laughs> if you're willing, we'd love to have you back on the show for a part two. You down? I'm happy to. No rush at all. We'd love to have you back, and we appreciate the time today. Tink, thanks for all you do on Racing Twitter. You bring a great service to everybody, and we're looking forward to talking to you again real soon. Great. I look forward to it as well. Thanks. All right, so that's going to do it for a very special episode 29 of Rail Talk. Thank you so much to Tinky for stopping by and having a chat with us. Hoping this is the start of a long and beautiful friendship with him and uh, Tinky's Corner Part 2 coming soon. Stay tuned for that. So thanks to Tinky for talking to us. Thanks to John Green, my co-pilot, for asking smart questions, as always. Thanks to our producer, Patty Wolf, for setting all that up and doing the hard work behind the scenes, as well as our associate producers, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Always appreciate you guys as well. And thanks to the sponsors, Basic Tipton, Green Group, and Taylor Made. You guys are the best. Couldn't do this without y'all. And especially thanks to you, the viewers and the listeners. We'll see you back here real soon on Rail Talk.